This episode of Around the Oval is brought to you by Todd Pennington with Revolution Mortgage. Hey, Ohio State fans. Welcome back to another episode of Around the Oval brought to you by Todd Pennington with Revolution Mortgage. We are here with one of the best in the NFL draft industry, Bleacher Reports, Matt Miller. Matt, thanks for joining the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Alex. Appreciate you having me on, man. And uh, I'm glad I'm here on the day after the Big Ten comes back. So we actually have football to talk about with, you know, the that prospect of being able to see these guys play another season. So I appreciate you having me on today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad we were able to do this after uh, the Big Ten made that decision. Certainly impacts um, a number of prospects on Ohio State. I know everyone wants to talk about Wyatt Davis and Sean Wade and what they're going to do, but Guys like Jonathan Cooper and Thayer Munford really needed this season to happen yeah. uh, boost their stock. So glad we'll get to talk about them. And so be, be, before we get into um, before we get into that, uh, I, I uh, you know I want to just talk about this year for you. No spring football, conference only seasons. Just a really unique as far as uh, what we've seen first other years and wanted to get your take on that um, being in your position as well as how big it is for the Big Ten to come back and, and how that helps you guys. I'm sure there was like a deep sigh of relief uh, to be able to evaluate, uh, you know, a lot of prospects in the Big Ten, not just Ohio State. Yeah, it's funny because I had just said this week was like, well, I can probably go ahead and file my report on Justin Fields because we're not going to see him play again. And then sure enough, a couple days later, the Big Ten's back. And so we're going to see him play again, which is good. Uh, you know, to your point about no spring ball, I think for folks, or at least for me, that's not a huge, uh, you know, that wasn't a huge deficit because I don't put a lot of stock into spring ball as far as like going to colleges, watching those games. Uh, more so it's communicating with coaches, you know, recruiting departments, even agents and scouts about like, hey, who's standing out? But anyone who's going to pop in spring ball for a draft analyst, we've probably seen them play last year. So, you know, because we're not looking at a true freshman or a redshirt freshman as draft eligible where, oh my God, this guy came in and he's just killing everybody. Like, uh, you know, so I, I think that's where it's a little bit different for us is because guys that we're looking at probably at least had some momentum to build off of last year. So the no spring ball wasn't the huge part of this that was concerning. It was more of how do you evaluate guys who haven't played in a year? And that's still going to be the case for some people. You know, we'll see if the Pac-12 gets going. You know, obviously a player like Trey Lance at the the FCS level is a little bit different. And so for Justin Fields, for, you know, Sean Wade, Wyatt Davis, those are probably the three top Ohio State prospects. This is huge news for them, and especially for Justin Fields, having a chance now to play a season coming off that knee injury that I think bothered him a lot last year. And getting that second year of film as a quarterback is so important. You know, we're living in a world right now where folks overemphasize Mitch Trubisky's potential after one year of a starter. And, and now we get to see year two of Justin Fields, which I think is so huge for not only his NFL success, but how accurately we can evaluate someone where it's not just 13 games of, of starting experience. Even with an eight-game season, getting, getting to that 21-game mark, I, I think it's going to be really big. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we, could, we could jump into this and start with Justin Fields. Um, I know you just commented on him a little bit. Like, I think, to your point, I think Dwayne Haskins a couple years ago had to go based on where his draft stock was. Like, if you're going to be a first-rounder, it's kind of hard not to go, especially coming off the year he had. But I think everyone that watched Ohio State would have would agree that he would have benefited from coming back another year, training with Ryan Day in the offseason, having more experience under his belt. And I think he got put in a poor situation in Washington. The offensive line was a mess. The coaching staff that didn't really want him – um, and kind of, you know, is he going to start? Is he not? He got thrown into a random game against the Giants last year. It wasn't the best situation. I think everyone kind of thought, you know, maybe going to a team that had a starter that he could sit behind and learn for a couple years would have been great. But Justin Fields does get that opportunity now with the Big Ten back to come back, have year two as a starter. Where do you see his draft stock entering the season and, and where could it go? Well, I, I have him right now as the number three quarterback. And Ohio State fans kill me when they hear that because it's like, what? how can you have him that low? But I, I do believe that he would be a top 10 draft pick if this season looks like last year's did, if we see that success of not turning the ball over. And so I do like him. And, and so I think I want to, you know, set the record straight on that. I'm a fan of Justin Fields, and I'm very excited to see what he looks like completely healthy because I think there's a lot to like in his game. I and mean, you can look at the accuracy – 
especially between the hashes. It's very, very good. The timing is there. The athleticism is there. And I don't even think we've really seen what he can do as an athlete because that knee injury that bothered him a little bit last year. I mean, the guy's built like Cam Newton, just a little bit shorter. So what he can do is not only a power runner between the hashes, but what he can do getting outside, you know, on end arounds, on design quarterback runs is very exciting. But then the arm talent, I think that's the key where I want to see him get the ball out a little bit faster. And then also, can he connect with better ball placement outside the hashes where that could just be, you, you got a knee that's bothering you. You can't plant and drive. You can't pivot as well. That's going to affect your accuracy on some of those longer throws. So I'm excited to see what his development is. I am a believer that he's a franchise quarterback. I, he's my Heisman favorite this year. And I do think when we talk about him transitioning to the next level with two years of starting experience, we're not necessarily looking at a guy that, ah, you need to go sit behind someone for a year. It, with two years of tape in the Big Ten and, and all that experience, breaking down defenses, making decisions, learning this Ryan Day offense, I think we're going to see a player that 2021, if that's when he elects to go to the NFL, and I, I would think it would have to be, that we're seeing somebody that could be a rookie starter and not in that Dwayne Haskins situation where, all right, you only had a year of starting experience uh, and, you know, you were pushed pretty hard by your backup when to be pretty good at LSU. You know, with Justin Fields, it's going to be a different story. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more about wanting to see him get rid of the ball a little bit quicker, process things a little bit quicker maybe this year. I think he relied on his legs a little bit to get out of trouble, and that's not going to be the case in the NFL. Uh, those guys are just going to eat him alive, um, you know, quicker. So definitely looking forward to seeing his progression. I think if he progresses even, you know, uh, 75% of what he would in a normal offseason year, I think uh, the, the finished product is going to be pretty good for Ohio State. Um, the guy who's going to be in the backfield for, uh, with him uh, a lot of the time this year is Trey Sermon, uh, grad transfer from Oklahoma, a lot to prove coming off an injury uh, uh, of his own kind. Um, I think this season is maybe even – it may not be bigger to anyone besides Trey Sermon. Uh, what are your thoughts on Trey right now, and, and what are you hoping to see from him this year? I'm so glad that he gets to play this year. I, I was really bummed that having seen him – I live in the in Big 12 country. Haven't seen him play at Oklahoma. You knew he was special. He just couldn't stay healthy. And so the transfer to Ohio State, it's like, oh, my gosh, we're going to get to see him unleashed in this offense with Wyatt Davis and, and Josh Myers clearing the way. I was so excited for him. And then the season gets shut down. So this is, like you said, you're absolutely right. No one on Ohio State is this is a bigger four than Trey Sermon, who just needs to show he can stay healthy. I mean, he has a chance to be in that running with Najee Harris and Travis Etienne and Chuba Hubbard. He could truly put himself into that tier of running back if he can stay healthy this year. I mean, I think he goes out with a bang. Obviously, Master Teague's there as well, who's a very talented player. But Trey Sermon has a chance to be – the type of running back that J.K. Dobbins was, you know, the type of running back that Ohio State's known for, where not only is he that safety valve in the passing game, but a person you can turn around and hand the ball to 20, 25 game, times a game, and he's going to be able to get the job done. I, I think it's just a matter of health when we talk about him projecting to the next level because, you know, the number of injuries at Oklahoma, I mean, it was, it was honestly just sad to see. It felt like every year he's going down with a new injury. So now that he's healthy – and with an offense that I think is suited to his skill set very well. I mean, whether it's RPOs or, you know, we're going to see him going off tackle. We're going to see him used in the screen game. Lincoln Riley's pretty good at his job, but, I mean, he's a quarterback guy. I think Ryan Day is more of let me get all my athletes involved, and that's going to be big for Trey Sermon. Yeah, and one of the other athletes uh, that's going to be featured in this offense is Chris Olave. Ohio State had a lot of veteran receivers in Austin Mack and Benjamin Victor and got and KJ Hill move on. And Chris Olave now all of a sudden becomes the guy. And, and he's really showed up in big games and yeah. kind of go-to guy for fields down the stretch last year. And I think you always, you know, I'm sure I talked to Dane last week and talking to you, I'm sure you're going to agree. You know, the NFL wants to see those guys step up in the big games against the best competition, but can Chris Olave do it consistently for a year? And what does he need to do to become a first-round pick? I don't know where you have him right now. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I, I'm seeing him as probably like an, a second-round pick maybe right now. Um, can he be a first-round pick? And where do you have him right now? I have him as a first-round pick already. I, so I love the way he plays. I think it's just a matter of getting more targets. Because like you said, you had those three seniors that were taking a lot of the target share last year. And J.K. Dobbins as a receiver out of the backfield. So I think Olave just really will emerge this year 
Hey, he's one of the best kept secrets in the Big Ten. And I believe it was the Penn State game was the last one I watched of Justin Fields. And I actually said to some of the guys in the office with me, I was like, man, Chris Olave is the real deal. And he plays so much bigger than he really is. I love the way that he tracked the ball, the catch radius, the routes, and the poise. You know, there were some sideline catches where it's like that. You don't expect that from, you know, a sophomore wide receiver to be making plays like that. So I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, some people at Ohio State might want me to shut up because maybe they think they can get him back for a senior season. But I am such a huge fan of his. Uh, I do think that, you know, he's not on that Jamar Chase level, but Think about that next tier wide receiver. Rashad Bateman has opted out. Sage Surratt has opted out. Rondell Moore has opted out. But I don't think it's crazy to hear Chris Olave get in there with the Jalen Waddles, with the Devonta Smiths, and find himself as that fourth wide receiver in this class, which is really, really talented. It's a good class. USC's got a couple kids who are really good as well. But he's definitely talented enough. And now that he's that true number one receiver, we're going to see him get those targets that he needs to prove himself. Yeah, definitely. And – Another guy who will be split out wide this year that I don't think enough people are talking about, just because maybe it's a little the way Ohio State uses the tight end. They use multiple tight ends. Um, I mean, they don't throw them a ton. I mean, it's hard. There's only one ball to go around, right? And you have J.K. Dobbins. Right. And you, have all, you have Justin Fields running the ball. But I watch – I'm from New Jersey, and I, and I lived in New York City. Um, and I watched Jeremy – I went out to Long Island a bunch when he was in high school. I watched Jeremy Ruckert. And – I think he has all the potential in the world. I think we started to see that flash toward the end of last year. He had that awesome catch in the Big Ten championship game. I, I, I think he could be a matchup nightmare, maybe split out a little bit wide, going against a linebacker, safety. Um, and I think, you know, potentially, if he has a big year, he could look at going to the NFL. I'm not saying he will, but he could. How much Jeremy Ruckert have you watched and, you know, do you think in your mind there's a possibility that he could end up being a, a three and out type of guy? You know, I wouldn't be surprised. And I, I'll be honest, I haven't watched a ton because when the season got shut down for the Big Ten, that you're focusing on the guys that you feel pretty good are going to declare. You know, you're watching Justin Fields, you're watching Sean Wade, Wyatt Davis, uh, players like that, and then some of the seniors as well. So with Rucker, I, I think the biggest question that I had and, and was waiting to see what happened at that tight end position was how much does Luke Farrell how much do they take targets away from each other? How much do they take playing time away from each other? Are we going to see a two tight end set from a Ryan Day offense? So I definitely think there's talent there and is probably someone that you look at the, you know, this is a very young wide receiver group outside of Chris Olave. So who's going to step up and be that number two target? It, I wouldn't be shocked if it becomes someone like Jeremy Ruckert. But, you know, as you said, there's no one ball to go around. You know, Garrett Wilson's a, a hell of a player, as you know. Uh, you've got a couple true freshmen coming in who are, really, really talented as well. So I, I do think it's just a matter of playing time. Uh, does he get on the field and become that go-to tight end that we, I mean, since Jeff Hireman, I think, you know, we really haven't seen an Ohio State tight end be that influential in the passing game. So there's a chance, but I think he's more someone that's kind of on the periphery. Like when you're watching a Justin Fields, you're okay. You know, what's number 88 doing out there? Let me, let me kind of take a peek at him. And then if you start to get the kind of the way it works with a player like that, where, there's not like a strong right now conversation that they might come out by October. You're probably hearing from scouts or agents, Hey, this player's going to come out. That's when I'm going to go back and watch them because this time of year, you're prioritizing your top tier underclassmen, like a Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, and then the top seniors, because they're players that you don't want to watch eight games of a guy. And then they decide to go back to school and you've wasted valuable, precious scouting time. So this time of year, it's, it's much, much more for me about the seniors. Yeah, and tight end's interesting because if you look back at Ohio State, actually, like, all, like even going back, like, a Jake Ballard, I mean, he was an undrafted guy who, if he didn't get the knee injury, I mean, he was the starting tight end for the Super Bowl winning Giants. Um, yeah. You met Ironman, I mean, he wasn't featured totally in the offense. He was a mid-round pick. Nick Vanette, um, same thing. I mean, he's, he's in the league. Marcus Ball is now active on the Washington Redskins roster. So, unfortunately for these tight ends at Ohio State, they're not featured the way, you know, a guy at uh, in Iowa or Wisconsin or – something along right. those lines, as you mentioned, you know, there's only one ball to go around. So to your point, it, it, I don't want to say it could benefit Ohio State because Jeremy Ruckert has a year where he catches, you know, 35, 40 balls and, you know, seven, eight touchdowns and goes to the league. You're like, well, that was great. He produced for me, um, especially with the younger receiving core. But at the same time, you know, maybe being able to keep him around for that senior year when Farrell leaves and, and whatnot could be beneficial too. So it will be interesting to see that. Um, the guys playing next to him on the offensive line, there's three of them that I think you're going to be taking a look at. Would love yeah. to dive 
to Thayer Munford, Wyatt Davis, who hopefully will be back with Ohio State by the time this runs. Uh, it seems like it's trending that way at, at the time we're recording this. And then uh, the center, Josh Myers. Would love your thoughts on Thayer Munford, Wyatt Davis, and Josh Myers. Yeah, this, so this is a really good offensive tackle class. I think that's where we have to start any conversation about Thayer Munford because he is a good player. This is a great offensive tackle class. Penny Sewell is one of the cleanest left tackle prospects of the last decade. And behind him, guys like uh, Dylan Raddins, Sam Cosme, uh, Spencer Brown. There's just so many talented players. Walker Little in the Pac-12, we get to see them play a season. So I think with Darren Munford, he's going to slot in somewhere in that third tier of offensive tackle prospect. I think the keys are, you know, being able to watch him against, you know, God, please give us him against, you know, Shaka Tony, against Quiddy Pay. Like, we want to see those matchups where we get to see him against some speed rushers because I think that is one area where he has struggled a little bit in the tape that I have seen up until this point. But the Ohio State offense, I'll be honest, it's a little tough evaluating those outside blockers because the ball a lot of the time is coming out very fast and it's coming out fast and underneath. So these guys aren't asked to do, you know, these big pass pro sets that you're going to see at a Wisconsin or that you're going to see – you know, at LSU last year, or when you go out to the Pac-12 and watch USC play, you're not seeing those same pass sets. So I think that is one of the things with Monfort is you want to find those matchups. As you said earlier, you want to evaluate guys in big moments. So against Penn State, against Michigan, those are the matchups that you're going to circle and say, okay, let me see what this guy can do and try to find 30, 35 plays where he's really asked to pass protect for three or four seconds and run off speed rushers and handle counter moves. You know, even though I think the best rushers in the Big Ten right now are, are those kind of smaller, faster guys. Those are the things I want to see. Like, can I see you in NFL moments? Can I see you succeed to where I can evaluate those traits? Because I think that's one of the hardest things with offensive tackles right now is we're just not seeing them in a lot of NFL moments where, okay, you have to pass protect. You have to truly go out and set the edge and redirect and show that counter agility. So that's what I'll be watching with Munford. With Wyatt Davis, and I hope he comes back because I love watching him play he's the best interior offensive lineman in the country, in my opinion. So if he doesn't come back, I think he's going to be a first round pick. Now the difference is coming back, he can solidify himself as a top 15 pick showing more in the pass game. We all know how much of an ass kicker he is in the run game. Like that's not going to change. The mentality is absolutely there. It's just showing up a little bit more in the passing game. And that's not a knock on him. I think that's just opportunity more than anything. And then with Josh Myers, uh, you know, as a redshirt junior, I'm a, a huge fan of his play he might be the best center in the country. It's him or Creed Humphrey at Oklahoma would be my top two guys at that position. So being kind of the captain of that offensive line, it, he's, he's exceptional. I think getting to that second level, you watch him play last year, you know, against, uh, I think it was Wisconsin last year, where getting to the second level against linebackers who are so athletic and he's able to get there and, and hold that point of contact. So I like what I see from Josh Myers. I think he's exactly what anyone running that, you know, kind of West Coast zone offense that we see in the NFL right now, like, you're going to look at Josh Myers and be like, that's my guy. Like, that's exactly what I want. It's not, you know, it's not a power scheme necessarily like you're going to get it in Alabama. And, and it's a little even different than what you get at Oklahoma. So I, I'd look at him and he might not be a first round pick. He might even be like a late second or early third, but I think he's a rookie starter, which if you can find that at the center position, you're in a really good spot. Yeah, and the thing I love about Josh Myers is I think his ceiling is very high because he's a guy who played in high school in like a triple option. They barely passed the ball. And so he didn't really have much pass pro experience coming into college. And then he wasn't even a center. So he had to learn the center position once he got to Ohio State. So the fact that I think he's been as productive as he has, um, you know, with just like a, a full year on film, I think this is a big year for him to show the development in year two. And then I think, you know, when you're a, a team looking to draft him, the ceiling is super high and, you know, he's just going to continue to develop and get better with the more football he plays. So um, get to see what he does this year. And, and same thing with Thayer. Thayer had a bad back injury last year. He played through it. And if he's healthy this year, you know, how much better does he look? That will be interesting it, to see. And so exactly. Your point, the Shaka Tonys, the Jason Oways, the, the quitty pays. Um, I would love to love to see those matchups too. So that will be, that'll be fun. Um, switching over to defense to, you know, kind of start wrapping things up. We got Jonathan Cooper, another guy I'm thrilled gets to play this year. He took kind of, I don't want to say a voluntary redshirt, but he had a decision to make 
you know, do I, do I save the year and come back or what? And he decided to do that. And, and for him not to have played would have stunk for him. But now he does get to play. He's a former five-star recruit. Um, I know he's had some injuries and whatnot, but excited to see him, you know, to me, I think he's almost a bubble guy as far as getting drafted right now. I don't know how you feel, but I think he's got a chance to at least play himself into, you know, maybe, maybe it's a, a day three pick or whatnot. What do you think about Jonathan Cooper? Yeah, I, the first thing that you hear about Jonathan Cooper when you talk to Ohio State coaches is how great of a leader he is, you know, how dedicated he is to the program, the commitment in on the field, in the classroom, in the weight room, like he's the guy, you know, you want a lot of Jonathan Cooper type players. As you said, I mean, he's hard to evaluate because you just the injuries are there and he's not really been in a featured role. That's not a knock on him. Nick Bosa and Chase Young were really, really good. You know, they're keeping guys like Jonathan Cooper off the field. So I, I like Jonathan. What I have seen is is promising. And he is a player that I did have like this is a day three pick based on everything I've seen and heard who has a chance to play himself up because uh, he's probably going to be the guy. I mean, we'll see what Zach Harrison looks like. We, we can't really talk about him yet because he's not draft eligible. But, you know, we'll see what what Cooper looks like. If if he can put it together on the field, we've seen this happen with guys. You know, where senior year, it clicks and you're able to stay healthy and you shoot way up that draft board. So uh, I think that that's a, a spot for him, you know, kind of mirroring what Chase Winovich did at Michigan, where it's like, we've heard so many great things about you. Now it's time to see it. And so I think for Cooper this year, you know, he is going to be the focal point on that defensive line with so many guys now going to the NFL, where I think uh, you know, Tommy Togai at, at Nose Tackles, uh, I, I know he was on my buddy Bruce Feldman's Freaks list. Like, he's special, and hopefully that opens things up for Jonathan Cooper because even a, not an Ohio State fan, uh, you know, born and raised in Missouri, but I'm rooting for someone like Cooper who has been such a great leader and, like, just you're waiting for him to have that opportunity to stay healthy and prove what type of player he is. Not even, like, who cares about the NFL draft for him right now? Like, go beat Michigan one more time as a senior leader. Like, you want that guy to have that moment, and then we'll worry about the NFL. But I think that just what he brings to the table from a leadership, a football IQ, a work ethic, like, that's going to get you drafted. And if he can stay healthy, he's going to stay on a roster. Yeah, absolutely. And another guy who I think, to your point of being able to shoot up in a year, is a linebacker, Baron Browning. We've seen the flashes. Yeah. Um, I don't think he's put it all together. I didn't think he had a very good game against Clemson. Um, but you know, they might use him this year in a little bit of a different role, not as a mic. Maybe it's, maybe it's on, you know, the weak side, maybe it's a, as a situational pass rusher kind of, uh, show some of his skill sets. What do you think about Baron Browning? Where, where does he stand right now as a draft prospect and where could he go? Yeah, I think the important thing to say first is this is the best linebacker core in college football, but you have three linebackers, three senior linebackers who are going to play in the NFL. And so a Baron Browning, like, I love like so the first thing I when I watch a player first thing I do is like look at body types height weight arm length speed he checks every box like you're you get excited just looking at the athleticism as you said you can play Mike you can play Will situational pass rusher uh, I think he can play in space very well when you get into those two linebacker situations which that's a lot of the NFL right now it's two linebackers five DBs it's a lot of nickel coverage so I think with with Browning that's what gets me most excited now I do think he's a little bit you know, overshadowed by a Pete Warner and like tough Borland just has the best name in college football. So people focus on him a little bit. And, and obviously that Borland last name is huge for linebacker play, but I think Baron Browning has a chance to be that sleeper on this defense that steps up and, you know, is a reason that, that y'all can beat a Clemson this year or that you have a chance against an Alabama or Oklahoma when you get into the college football playoffs, because you're going to need those matchups. And, you know, hopefully that bitter taste left in his mouth watching Trevor Lawrence, you know, a quarterback keeper so many times last year, hopefully that's that driving force of, I'm going to dedicate myself to the film room, you know, so that I can get those instincts that match up with the athleticism. And it's where you have that awareness of, okay, I know what's coming. Sometimes with players like that who are so athletic, the, the instincts and the awareness come a little bit late. So I think that's what I'll be watching this year to see, you know, can he develop that? Uh, you know, I said with the offensive tackle group, it's a really good group. It's a really good group at linebacker too. You know, Micah Parsons has opted out of Penn State he's the best in the country but you guys are going to see a lot of really good linebacker play in the big 10 and i think browning's got a shot to shoot himself up the board yeah definitely and uh you know last guy we're going to talk about i know we're running out of time here but it's sean wade uh sean wade opted out uh again at the time of this recording we don't know what's going to happen with sean wade i have a hunch he might try to come back uh now because i think well i still think 
I don't know how you feel. I, I think he's still a first round pick, but I think he can really lock that in and maybe be a top 15, top 10 potentially guy if he gets the full year of outside corner on that film to go along with what he's shown in, in the slot and at safety. What are your thoughts on Sean Wade? Does he need to come back, show another year of film? And where does he stand right now for you? Yeah, so this is tough, Alex, because with guys like, should he come back? You know, like, it would help his draft stock. It would. And so sometimes it comes down to what's best for your draft stock and what's best for your NFL career. And a lot of times those aren't the same thing. You know, like with Dwayne Haskins, best thing for his NFL career would have been another year of college. Best thing for his draft stock was to declare. Sean Wade's the rare dude where those kind of match up. Like, I think the best thing for his NFL career is also to show a little bit more versatility and coverage where we're seeing him against the top receivers in the Big Ten. And there's some doubt right now about Nico Collins, right? Maybe he signed an agent. So, but being able to see those matchups, you know, seeing Sean Wade take that role that Jeff Okuda or take a spot that Damon Arnett filled to where he is going up against the best of the best. And this is a team I expect we're going to see in the college world playoffs. So seeing him against a Devonta Smith at Alabama and watching what he can do there, I think that's huge for his draft stock because not that it's as derogatory as it used to be, but we think about, oh, he's a slot corner. And you kind of, you know, you knock a guy a little for that. So I think that's the key is proving that he is like the rightful heir to that outside corner spot at Ohio State where you're damn near guaranteed to be a top five pick if you're that guy. You know, what Denzel Ward, Jeff Okuda, like think of the line of corners that y'all have had is special. So I know the expectation is that Sean Wade will be that guy, and I am a big fan of his, but I don't think it's automatic. I do think that he needed another year to prove himself with a Caleb Farley, who's opted out, with Patrick Sertan the second at Alabama. There's some really good corners out there, and, and Sean Wade's one of them. But I, I do think he needed this year to show that he belongs in that conversation. Yeah, well, Ohio State fans are certainly hoping he comes back and gets to prove that. Uh, Matt, appreciate your breakdowns. Really great insight. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll talk to you in a few months after the season and get your, get your updated thoughts. Uh, you know, hopefully that's not until January-ish and Ohio State's playing for college football playoff, potentially a national championship. But thanks for joining the show and continue to stay safe out there. Yeah, I appreciate it, Alex. You do the same, man. Good luck this season. This episode of Around the Oval was brought to you by Todd Pennington with Revolution Mortgage. If you've been thinking about refinancing or buying a house, check out our sponsor, Todd Pennington with Revolution Mortgage. They offer low rates for refinancing and home purchase loans, including first-time home buyer programs, down payment assistance, and cash-out home equity loans. Check out revolutionmortgage.com slash T. Pennington.